Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, week's uh, nature seminar. And uh, before I introduce uh, this week's uh, speaker, I'll just mention the, the, the last week, which is the last week of, of events. Uh, and uh, two things. Firstly, on next Friday at the usual slots, we've got Laura martinez Suz from Kew Gardens talking about mycorrhizae and the role of below ground biodiversity. Uh, but also an extra thing to mention is on Monday at the Martin School at 5 p.m., Julia Jones, who's a vis visiting, will be talking about is conservation working? And that's, that's, that's a separate thing. So you go to the Martin School website and register if you want to go to that, uh, either in person or, or, or online. And that's a Monday at, at five o'clock uh, uh, there. And we've got a wonderful uh, uh, program being lined up for next next week's, uh, next term's uh, speaker events. Uh, yeah, the one I'll mention because I just got I just got up a conversation yesterday is Tim Smith, the founder of the Eden Project, will be talking about the transformative power of kissing frogs. <laughs> so that'll be that'll be one talk to. Uh, but we've got an amazing lineup of speakers kind of coming together for the next term uh, as well. Uh, okay, so over to today's uh, speaker. It's a great pleasure to introduce James Bullock, who's a conservation ecologist at the Center for Ecology and Hydrology, uh, which is based uh, at Wallingford, quite near here. Uh, and here's a long history of, of work, both fundamental and applied, looking at rewilding, restoration, agroecology. Uh, he did his undergraduate degree at Imperial and uh, his uh, PhD at Liverpool, and then uh, a, a bit of postdoctoral work with the Open University, working in Britain and Plumps, uh, nearby here, I just I just found out, and then has been at what was, was the Institute for Terrestrial Ecology, and then became the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. Uh, uh, where he's been for quite a quite a while now. <laughs> so I'll give it that. Uh, so uh, thank you, to James, for joining us. Afterwards, there's a drinks reception around the corner. So do come and uh, have an informal conversation with us afterwards as well. So over to you. Thanks, Yudhavinda. Uh, I think you can hear me. Uh, hello, everyone. Nice to see you all here today. And thanks to Yudhavinda for the invitation. So you can see... Um, the title is a bit of a buzzword bingo, isn't it? Rewilding, restoration, nature recovery. Um, but hopefully isn't just buzzwords. Uh, these are all things which we're very interested in. And what I'm going to talk today a bit about is um, what does the future hold for conservation at a time of rapid environmental change? And particularly, what's the role of rewilding and restoration in dealing with that? Um, uh, you've got this subtext heading here. We, we all know about biodiversity. Lost going to talk a bit about that, the drivers, what the future holds, or our lack of understanding of what the future holds and what we might do about it. And right at the end, I'll talk about how we make it happen. Um, and what I'm going to do is draw on work which I've been involved with mostly, that the, the examples will be here, but also some other examples. I'll try to make clear where it's my stuff versus other people's stuff. Obviously, the good stuff is mine. If it's rubbish, it's someone else's work. So biodiversity loss, we all know it's happening, it's terrible, it's rapid, it's, it's not getting any better. Um, but what's the extent and the future prospects across the world? Well, one project I was involved with, led by Forrest Isbell, is uh, using slightly different approaches to actually going and measuring stuff, is trying to uh, get the opinions of a range of biodiversity experts, people working on biodiversity conservation and loss, across the globe um, and asking them what their understanding about rates of loss and the impacts were for the taxa and the ecosystems which which they're most familiar. And we asked them a number of questions, uh, got quite a good range of responses. So you see uh, uh, over 3,000 uh, 3, responses across a wide range of countries, uh, conducting research in most of the countries across the globe. And uh, one interesting thing was these estimates. They're actually slightly higher than the more quantitative, the data-based estimates. And that may be because people, uh, as biodiversity experts, are more gloomy than the data sets. But we also think it's because the people, uh, less represented people in, um, in uh, the biodiversity world from the global south and also women, tended to give higher estimates, probably representing things which we know less about. So... These experts estimated about 30% of species have been become globally threatened or extinct since 1500. That's since globalization really started. And uh, 
expect this trend to really continue quite strongly over the next decade or so if current trends continue. So we're not seeing this plan, hope for nature recovery that many people talk about. If current trends continue, it's gonna get worse. And of course, this is terrible for biodiversity and species involved. And I'm gonna focus mostly on biodiversity per se, rather than human benefits from biodiversity. But the other outcome of this is the overwhelming consensus, the last point, that this will decrease the function of the ecosystems and also the benefits people get from nature. So I'm not gonna focus on that, I'm gonna focus on biodiversity as a thing which we should value in and of itself. What are the drivers of this loss? Um, something, uh, we know a lot about what drivers are involved. We don't know their relative importance very well, but the experts came up with quite, quite strong patterns. So types of driver, land and sea use change, uh, that's a general catch-all for things like degradation, destruction, conversion of habitats. And uh, this, oh, I'm trying to work out how to use this pointer thing. Where is it? There it is. So this, um, what these graphs show is the dark blue is where it's ranked first, then second, third, fourth, fifth. So what these are showing is that generally across uh, our global survey, people ranked land and sea use change top, climate change next, over-exploitation, which is hunting, extraction of natural resources, uh, overfishing, those sort of things. Next, pollution, next, or not pollution, is an invasive alien species last. And you can see this map, map show uh, that the global distribution of what people think about these drivers. So this land and sea use change on the terrestrial part of the globe is by far the strongest. Climate change is quite interesting patterns. So the boreal or the poleward areas, regions, thought mostly affected by climate change, and then some interesting patterns elsewhere. And you go through all the others. What this shows here on the, on the left is uh, the sea areas. And you can see interesting here that climate change is the strongest driver there. So what to take home from that is that um, there's a quite good understanding of what drivers involve. There's some very strong uh, opinions and thoughts about which are the main ones. And you can see land and sea use change going through. And but climate change is there, but quite interesting variation in what people think about it. So the standard approach to what we do about biodiversity loss, these drivers of biodiversity loss is to say we need, well, the current phrase is nature recovery. We want to do nature recovery. And the approach we've seen in this country and many other areas, and which is becoming enshrined in, in, in national and international law, is the idea of protected areas where we have hive off areas which we protect for nature, we reduce human impacts in them, and all well and good. And there was the famous Lawton Review uh, quite a few years ago now where there was a strong point made that for future nature recovery, we need to have these protected areas to be bigger, they need to be better, i.e. they need to be better looked after because a lot in not very good condition, there need to be more of them, and they need to be joined up, so with corridors or stepping stones or whatever in between them. And this is uh, sort of seen in the, the idea of 30 by 30, which if you haven't come across it, is this uh, international uh, agreement that we, uh, all signatories, all nations that have signed to it, should be aiming to have 30% of land and sea uh, effectively protected for nature by 2030. There's been a lot of excitement about this, I think, the Wildlife and Countryside Link in England are doing great work on this and showing this graphic here from the 2023 report. They say 3% of land is currently effectively protected for nature in England. And that figure hasn't really changed for the last two or three years. So basically, it's a great idea, but not much happening in this country. It's, having, it's, happening, it's better elsewhere, but not here. So... I'm going to think, talk a bit about climate change now and where this leaves us with this idea of protecting areas and aiming for nature recovery. So I mentioned just now that this is general consensus that this land and sea use change is the major driver of biodiversity loss. Um, and that's quite imbued in conservation thinking, I would say. And there was this uh, paper, I haven't mentioned names here because I don't like dissing people in public, but the, um, you can probably find it anyway. There's paper in Conservation Letters saying 
uh, climate change is not the principal driver of biodiversity loss. And let's use the verb tense is being used here. And they said, uh, da, 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 none of the arguments founded on climate change's wide ranging effects are as urgent for biodiversity as those for habitat loss and over exploitation, which is fair enough. But um, we did a response, Aaron Thierry, Charlie Gardner and I saying, why the hell are you saying this basically? We, we need to think about the future and the recent past is not a reliable guide to future climate impacts. And we said, I'll read it out. Given the accelerating and nonlinear nature of climate change impacts, the recent past is not a reliable guide to future change. Conservation must look to the future if it is to successfully anticipate and mitigate biodiversity loss. And that's what I'm gonna talk about, what that future holds and what we understand about it. And going back to that paper, I've lost my pointer, uh, I mentioned just uh, now with the global uh, survey of experts, they were asked about climate, global warming, climate change, global heating, I prefer to call it, um, and asked what they think the percentage of species becoming uh, extinct or threatened would be under one degree, two degree, or five degrees of climate of global warming. And you can see with, well, with what we're heading towards now, about three, and we haven't got a figure for that, but basically they're talking about quite large numbers. So that black line is the average, and these are the, uh, the 95% confidence intervals, I think. So under five degrees, the consensus is about half species becoming threatened or ex uh, extinct or threatened. And very recently, um, 17th of this month was officially the first day the global temperature exceeded two degrees above pre-industrial levels. And I think the next day it was also above it. It's probably gone down a bit if today's anything to go for in this country, but basically we're heading very fast for very large levels of climate change. So given climate change and the fact that we can't look to the, even the recent past for thinking about the future under climate change, how do we look to the future? Um, well, the classic thing is doing modeling. The people in this room do modeling, Tom in the front row does modeling on these things. So. Uh, I'm going to run through some work we've been doing on doing looking about the future to the future for the UK per se. And this is a project I ran in CH called SPEED. I came up with the acronym, nothing else. No, I came up with the idea as well. Spatially explicit projections of environmental drivers and impacts. And a very helpful reviewer said, that's not a proper acronym. But I said, so what? It's a good title. But... But no one, and of course my surname is Bullock, Speed, I thought, but then no one funded Speed soon. So we all know that's a load of crap anyway, is not it? So I've said, I've said that joke many times the last few years, but hopefully it's a new audience. Um, so what we did here was that uh, the future isn't just about climate change, it's about other changes as well. And the IPCC uh, has a so-called uh, scenario framework where they think about climate scenarios, uh, which we have all heard about, the so-called RCPs, Relative Concentration Pathways. Is that the right word? I think the P is wrong. Oh, it's right, thank you. Um, but also there's looking at socioeconomic futures as well, about how society may change, what our exploitation of the natural world may be. And these are so-called uh, uh, shared socioeconomic pathways. And what we did is we, we uh, detailed these scenarios under the, the IPCC framework for the UK um, and put them together to get scenarios of how things like climate, land use, et cetera, may change in the future. So we projected future land use under these scenarios, looked at uh, had pollution experts as well. They, they're doing work on heavy metal pollution and what that might look like in the future. And ultimately looking at possible biodiversity change, which is what I'll talk about. Um, just to show you the sort of stuff we've created. So we've got future climate scenarios for the UK. And uh, what, uh, it's quite a nice, that's the right word, quite a interesting map, which is uh, temperature extremes, the top 10%, uh, sorry, temperature extremes uh, across the different climate scenarios. RCP 2.6 is the least, uh, uh, extreme climate scenario and 8.5 is the most, and those are in between. And these are different uh, types of different, these are different models. So basically, if we do climate modeling, we use different models and try to get consensus amongst them. 
So we've run different models. We've um, uh, got lots and lots of data out for people, free for anyone to use who wants to use it to look at the future. Are these, just for illustration, these maps show uh, percentage of days 20, from 2060 to 2080 for which the temperature exceeds, is in the top 10 percentile of the historic. So basically, uh, it's uh, unsurprising, it's gonna get bleeding hot. They've got lots of extreme temperatures under the most extreme climate scenario, but even so, quite a lot, even on the, on the least extreme. And I think that's one thing which will come through, that even the least extreme climate scenario, which we're, we're exceeding already, you're getting a lot of change happening. Anyway, people are interested in data. There's quite a lot of stuff we've provided, produced, high resolution, one kilometer, uh, high temporal resolution, daily meteorology, all the uh, ICPCC scenarios and uh, various other things, which I won't go into detail about, but it's all there and the paper's nearly out, but the data is already there if you want to use it. We've also done uh, these shared socioeconomic pathways where we've got narrative accounts of what future societies would like under these scenarios, quantify projections of things like, I don't know, uh, resource use, uh, population, uh, building infrastructure, loads and loads of different things. And also we've used them, put together these scenarios to project future land uses as well, which again, that's all freely available for people to use. But most relevant today is we've also used them, these projections to look at uh, biodiversity futures. And I one thing to really emphasize is these, S these RCPs, 2.6, 4, 6.5, 8.5, are not saying this is what will happen. They're just a range of scenarios so we can explore possible futures. Um, so that's what we've done with the biodiversity side of things. And this is, um, a lot of people use uh, uh, species distribution models, see what climate uh, space species live in now, look at the future climate space and say, this is where the species could live. Is, it, uh, is there anything left? How far away is it from the existing stuff? This is a rather complicated approach, which Tom here in the front is an expert on, so you can ask him any questions, because I don't believe, no, I do understand it's all from. Basically it's looking at whole communities rather than individual species and so it's asking how, as you go over space from one point to another, how does the community of plants, butterflies or birds change? And how, is that, how does that relate to environmental variables, especially climate? So it's compositional dissimilarity as uh, composition, species composition changes, how is that related to environment, especially climate? It's a bit of a hard one to explain. I don't feel I've done a great job here, but basically it's a great way of looking at how um, the future climate may be very different for species to live in as communities than it is now. And two things you can get out from it is disappearing habitats. One is, one is disappearing habitats where um, you have climate, the climate species live in now being lost in the future. So these maps show for the least extreme climate change, 2.6, the most extreme, 8.5, for plants, butterflies, and birds, um, the degree to which we're getting habitats disappearing for these groups of species under climate change, uh, let's see how many years hence, 40 to 60 years hence. And what's this showing is that plants, especially, were showing a large loss of climate space, climate, uh, the climate space species can live in, in the future. Butterflies less so, and birds somewhere in the middle. And interestingly, as I said, even the least extreme climate scenario is showing a lot of change. And these are the means. So basically, half, you're losing half of your available climate habitat, if you like, climate space species can live in under these scenarios. We also have something which we call novel habitats, which is the flip side where we have combinations of climate variables in the future, which we're not seeing today. Um, so it's, it's, it's sort of unprecedented environments, climate environments for species. And again, biggest changes for plants, 
and a, a diff, the most extreme climate scenario is worse than the least extreme, but even the least extreme is seeing a big change. Uh, not so bad for butterflies or birds, but still pretty bad. So quite a bit of a hard concept to grasp what this means. SDMs are much easier, but basically what these climate change scenarios, even the least extreme climate change is showing a huge loss of climate space that species can live in, especially for plants, which are, of course, the base of the food chain. And what this, this just looks at the climate environment for species, not all the interactions. And that brings me on to the next thing, which is, as I said, those are scenarios of change. Uh, we can, people, you know, climate scientists are modeling change and seeing how their models track what's happening, but there's huge uncertainty. And I think that's something as conservation ecologists we have to deal with. We can't pretend it's not there. So there's a number of levels of different types of uncertainty about what climate change will look like and especially what the impacts on biodiversity will be. So this is quite a famous graphic uh, published quite a few years ago, which basically is called the, uh, the cascade of uncertainty. So basically as you go, you, you have some idea about maybe what future society may be doing, but then some uncertainty about what that means for greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there's extra uncertainty when you decide which climate model you're gonna use. Then when you downscale that to regions, and if you look at the different impacts and how you model that, and then if you downscale those impacts. So the biodiversity stuff sort of comes down here. You have all that uncertainty about what the future is going to hold, but then what the impacts are on biodiversity are even more uncertain. And I think we're always going to be living in that. We can't be precise. There's quite a big effort. Some people are really arguing for, we need better models of biodiversity responses to climate change. But my feeling is that's always going to be a huge uncertainty. Um, so how do we deal with that? Another other uncertainties, what I talked about just now was uh, aspects of mean climate, mean uh, maximum uh, summer temperature, mean minimum uh, winter temperatures. Uh, what we know with climate change is bringing more and more extremes. So what's the impact of extremes on biodiversity? My point is no longer working. It's probably me, yeah. The impacts of streams like drought and fire uh, which we know is increasing. And there's, there is work, there's actually a paper I saw out in Nature today or last week about uh, impact of a, a cyclone on, I think it was on African mammals and just the complex impacts of that. Generally bad, but bad, worse for us some than others. So we don't really understand what those extremes will do. We saw that those terrible wildfires in Australia a couple of years ago. Other things we don't really understand very much about is uh, this goes back to that paper about the global uh, opinion, uh, expert opinion paper. And so we have all these drivers I talked about, uh, climate change, over exploitation, pollution, land and sea exchange. And generally, experts think these things will have synergistic effects. They'll have interactions which actually make things worse. And climate change is one of the major aspects of that. So. Uh, the darker blue, the stronger that synergistic effect is. And synergistic is bad in this case because it has makes the um, effects even worse. So if you if you basically it makes sense, if you've got a knackered landscape and you throw climate change at it, it makes things worse. If you throw climate change at an area, then species, invasive alien species from other parts of the world are better able to establish and wreak their havoc. So those interactions on the drivers, we know in principle they exist, but what impact, precise impact they will be. We don't know. Another thing is whether species, we talked about these climate space species can live in and whether they'll exist in the future. And even if they do exist in the future elsewhere, can they actually get these new areas? And so we've done work in the past on the ability to track climate change. This is some modeling work we did, that even from suggesting even for mammals, uh, which are quite mobile, much more mobile than plants and many other things, uh, and our relatively straightforward model approach, we it suggested that 30% of mammals would be theoretically unable to spread, to keep up with climate change. So think of climate change as spreading in space. So you're, where you can live, move somewhere else in space, 30% of mammals unable to actually track that. And that's over a landscape, which is in perfect condition. If you've got it knackered, you've got roads going across it, you've got buildings, you've got sterile, arable fields, that makes it even worse for them. So that's really 
the lowest estimate rather than a, a, a good a good high estimate. So probably even worse. Um, and I think one last thing about this uncertainty is extinction cascades. So I talked earlier about plants, birds, butterflies. But then in these, what we were doing, they're not interacting. There's a nice, I say nice, scientifically nice, horrid, really, if you think about it as a normal human being, uh, a really Im important paper, I thought, on based on a, a big supercomputer model where they modeled lots of species interacting uh, across the globe and then through climate change at it. This is higher level of climate change, lower level. And then said, uh, looked at what the primary extinctions were driven by climate change. And then said, well, if those species go extinct, uh, what other species go extinct with them because they're dependent on those. And these are, if you look at the trophic level above one, are things which eat plants and things which eat things that eat plants, um, you get very large co-extinction processes. So uh, the dark blue is a 200% increase, uh, which you're seeing across Sub-Saharan Africa. But um, it looks okay for us because basically we screwed everything already. So there's probably not much demand on everything else, but basically these extinction cascades are really important as well. So that's all terrible, isn't it? We know something bad is happening we don't know exactly what impact it's going to have, but we know it's going to cause a lot of problems. So how can we do conservation in the age of huge uncertainty about the future? Well, something uh, Charlie Gardner and I did was we, we sort of we threw the gauntlet down and said, conservation ecology needs to become survival ecology. Our argument here was that um, conservation you might disagree with this, but we argue conservation is largely centered and often marketed on preventing species extinctions. But existing efforts have certainly we haven't prevented biodiversity loss and extinctions. We may have slowed it. That's arguable. And what from what I've just talked about, those prospects for preventing further extinctions become ever remote in the climate emergency. And that's the phrase term I like using: climate emergency, not global warming or little nice little phrases like that it's a climate emergency uh, and we argued conservation should ultimately be about look at the ecosystem level promoting complex well-functioning and importantly resilient ecosystems to help them adapt to climate change and there's a bit of a throwaway to ensure ongoing benefits to humans so it isn't just for the other uh 8.1 million minus one species in the world is for us as well. If we have these resilient, well-functioning ecosystems, we benefit as well. And so we said, um, let's have a paradigm shift in how we talk about things uh, moving from biodiversity conservation to what we call survival ecology, safeguarding a planetary system which humans and other species can thrive. And it's getting a bit of uh, uptake. I quite impressed or pleased that this nice uh, Oxford, very short introduction to biodiversity conservation done by Oxford's very own David MacDonald mentioned our paper there and said, Char Charlie and James wrote forcefully, the earth faces a climate emergency that renders conservation goals largely obsolete. Taken slightly out of context, it sounds more extreme than we said, but I stand by that. So, and this is what we said we need to think about in the climate emergency. So um, we talked about, rather than thinking about maintaining, maximizing species persistence in the short term, we should be maintaining the conditions for complex life. So um, promoting adaptation and functioning in the long term, rather than trying to keep things as they are. And so, um, Rather than being reactive and seeking to prevent or reverse biotic change, we have to uh, we have to accept the reality of climate change, biotic climate driven biotic change, and shape the outcomes rather than prevent. And obviously, ideally, we prevent and stop climate change tomorrow. Uh, currently, around the world, in this country, and with various political elections recently, that prospect seems even further away now. So that's a sort of pragmatic approach, and. We argued again about prioritizing future function, complex functional ecosystems 
and maintenance of ecological and evolutionary process. So nature itself can adapt to the future. And interestingly, that doesn't necessarily mean we change absolutely what we do, it's just the emphasis. So we talked about natural climate solutions. Yeah, protected areas are important, but they need to be adapted and adaptable to future change. But also things like novel ecosystems, which has gone from being anathema to people talking more and more about them. Uh, rewilding, which again, not that much long ago was seen as a big uh, silly idea, has become more mainstream now. And I'll talk about that lilac box right at the end. So recovery for functioning and resilience. So one argument would be, well, conservation does that already. We're, we're sort of, by looking after species and uh, groups of species in a particular location, we are also allowing it to be highly functioning and resilient. So highly functioning is things like doing all the things a good ecosystem does, decomposition, gas exchange, uh, using the resources in a usually quite a tight circle, not losing a lot uh, to the outside world, basically sort of ecology 101, or ecosystem ecology 101, I should say. And resilience is um, being able to respond to the different types of shocks and perturbations that systems get. So rapid onset, like when you get a uh, sudden uh, disease spread through an area, chronic, like this is eutrophication of an area, and transitory, like fire. So different types of uh, environmental change and the ability to uh, for the function to stay on that flat line and not really change rather than go through rapid change or for those of you into these sort of things, hysteresis of transitioning to an alternative state. And what we argued in this paper a few years ago was that stability of species composition is not in itself a necessary prerequisite for the resilience of ecosystem function. Indeed, turnover of a species and the communities might be the very thing that allows resilient functions. So maintaining the same species complement may not be what you need for keeping an ecosystem going, especially if the environment is changing greatly. So um, that's a sort of, in a sense, uh, conceptually, what can we actually do to prepare for uh, climate change and other drivers, of, uh, ongoing drivers of biodiversity loss and actually expand what we do rather than just uh, do a sort of bit of a fortress approach. Restoration is one where we can, um, and I think restoration we want to sort of give us a way of thinking about what even how we think about protected areas rather than just keeping stuff as they are in protected areas, but actually changing and adapting them to be more resilient to future change. And I think restoration we want in because they are all about change and uh, moving a system that's been become degraded to in a more positive state, they really can give lessons for wider conservation. The restoration ecology, ecological restoration being around for a very long time. And uh, we have we've got an International Society for Ecological Restoration, SER, that has its international principles and standards and defines restoration in the way you can see, uh, assisting in the recovery of an ecosystem that's been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. Um, and what happens usually for restoration is we have these degraded ecosystems. You can see on the top here, uh, an area that's been mined or coral that's been trawled or a mangrove that's been logged or uh, a field that's been plowed again and again for arable agriculture. And what generally the approach for restoration is trying to get that back to some what SER called the reference state of a native ecosystem. Native is a bit of a dangerous word, but basically they're talking about what they think was there before. And this could be that native forest, a coral reef, mangrove swamp, or hay meadow. And we do a number of things, like we put soil there if it's become totally denuded, we put trees there, we create artificial reefs, we sow wildflowers and manage it. And this is a very rich area, huge amount of research and practice gone on, on um, to allow us to get back to those native ecosystems. But we've argued 
recently we have a project on it that is that the way we should be thinking for the future? Should we be trying to return to some past which may be no longer relevant under climate change? And so we came up, we used this term of complexity, argued again, future restoration, we said should, it's probably a bit extreme to say should, but it'd be quite good if it did. If I put that in the title of paper, you get rejected. Enhance ecological complexity what we call the emergent properties at multiple scales. What do we mean by that? Well, what's complexity? I talked about, I mentioned it a few times, haven't I? And people like saying, what do you mean by complexity? And people come up with really complex um, definitions of complexity. So I summarized here, we did in the paper, uh, talking about temporal dynamics, spatial organization or structure of a system uh, using properties like Shannon entropy, dispersion, fractal dimension, network structures. Um, uh, and I've read these papers, I still don't know what they mean, but you know, these really complex ways of describing complexity. Uh, quite a nice one is the amount of ecological information in a system, but how the hell do you measure that? Um, so in our looking through the literature, we thought there were two aspects uh, that uh, um, encompass the complexity of an ecological system, probably other systems as well. And that's to do with number and connection. So number, is like the number of species, the evenness of distribution of species, in, uh, uh, the evenness and abundance of a species, of the species, or at a larger scale, the number of habitat types. Connections, the number of interactions among species, pollinators going to uh, plants, uh, predators eating prey, decomposers decomposing different aspects of uh, the uh, litter, um, and energy pathways. And so we described it quite simply as the number of components in a system and the number of connections amongst them. And that can relate to architectural complexity, how uh, the number of uh, sort of plant types you have in a system, functional groups, the different types of things things do, and larger scale habitats, et cetera. And this graphic here has got, uh, got a bit weird. Anyway, it describes that, that low complexity, you have one or two species in a system, like a I don't know, like a uh, standard permanent grassland in Britain, which would be like ryegrass and clover. That's low complexity. And then you increase complexity, you get more species there and they start interacting in multiple different ways and uh, uh, different species are interacting with other species and uh, what's one species interacts with three others and et cetera. So you get lots and lots of things happening and different types of interaction it could be pred predation, it could be mutualisms, et cetera. And so this would basically, I think a lot of people who go into uh, forests or complex grasslands would say, yes, that's how I see what's happening there. So, uh, but we can actually measure it in some way. It, the same applies at the landscape scale. So low complexity, you have a, have a, a few habitats with a few species in. Um, actually, probably those should be sharing species as well to make them even less complex. So it's very even everywhere. Then you get to a complex landscape, you've got lots of things happening in each habitat patch, and you've got lots of ways they're connected with corridors or stepping stones, etc. So you can apply this at different scales. And there's loads of literature out there about how complexity as defined in this way links to ecosystem functions and resilience. So that's what these blue bubbles show. So what we've got here is different ways in which I've just said you can measure complexity or characterize complexity and information out there on how that links to functioning, the production of the vegetation, decomposition, water cycling, pollination, et cetera. And also a lot on that, how resilient these functions are related to these complexity measures. So there's a good literature on those relationships. So this gives us a basis of thinking about, well, actually, if we can get complexity back, we can maybe get all these other things. And we're doing that in this project with a terrible, I didn't come up with this acronym, so it's terrible, REST RECO, Restoring Resilient Ecosystems. I think I came up with a better one, but it was too rude. Um, so we're saying, what do you need to do to restore complex ecosystems rather than just ones which look like some historical precedent? And restoration is usually always about time, it just waits and things happen. But we, we're actually thinking about, well, we want to speed things up, we want to get things going. So we may want to get more interventionists, putting things into the system which aren't, weren't necessarily there before, which is going to take a long time to arrive. People do that a lot in restoration, but usually in a very plant-based, bottom-up approach. Um, so do a, a diversity of approaches, and that's 
quite different from a Bruce restoration where we're saying, this is the approach we use, I'm gonna apply it. And let's do a range of different things to get a bit of a mosaic going. Um, as I said, obviously, I lost my mouse again. It's it going? I'm pressing the wrong button. Oh, well, never mind. Um, targeting complexity, so not these reference ecosystems, but uh, sort of, a, as my colleague, uh, Jim Harris from Cranfield said, basically what you want to do is an alien came to this planet. I don't know why I'm saying this, it's just a stupid analogy. But anyway, an alien came to this planet, all it could see was uh, complexity, that's what it, be, it may see a grass in the forest and not actually be able to differentiate the two because they're both really nice and complex, but it will hate that field with just rye grass and clover in. It makes it means they are, I think this has died. Or is it, oh no, it hasn't died, I've died. Um, it's, ad it's adaptive, that complexity makes it able to adapt, well, more able to adapt to future change. And I think one thing I haven't really talked about, and it's probably a theme I should be really mentioning is large scale. These things need to be done over large areas. And I'll get on to rewilding in a minute, as you can see. Um, and that one great thing about rewilding is to think about large scale. Restoration needs to think large scale. So we can get lots of different things happening over large areas. How do we measure it? We've got the list of things here, some of which is used st standard in restoration, but uh, many other things, uh, probably less so. Uh, so the uh, things like species richness people often look at, but I think quite a lot more we need to look at interaction web. So this shows one interaction web of pollinators visiting flowers in a grassland. Uh, and this is put together by my colleague, Ben Woodcock, just showing a very complex pollination web. And other areas, we've got very simple ones. Um, looking at the soil, what's happening down there. Soundscapes is, for those of you who haven't come across it, that's the latest big thing in ecology. <laughs> so actually going, putting out recorders out there and seeing what sounds are going on. And that's this emerges quite a cool way of actually trying to encompass a lot of information. And, and this is another way in which we're trying to characterize complexity of the system. Where is that? So that's restoration. We're arguing for pushing restoration from this sort of looking backwards to looking forwards. Um, rewilding is another really exciting approach. And unlike restoration, it's, it's a bit of a, uh, well, it's, it's quite a new, it's been around for quite a while, but really has, come to the fore the last few years, especially in the UK and across Europe. Um, and if you, there are lots of projects, in, uh, bottom up projects going on, really, really exciting ones. And if you look around, you can uh, maybe characterize them as I've got them here. You might be able to think of other ways people are doing things. So one thing is um, uh, natural colonization, just allowing uh, thing, uh, having areas, brownfield sites or uh, uh, arable land, this was arable land 60 years ago, um, allowing it to recolonize naturally and seeing what you get. So the, the idea is it might be much more random, stochastic, variable, rather than sort of standard thing by planting set number of trees or types of trees there. Um, getting wilder grazing going on, that's quite a common thing. I've got some pigs here, mangalitsa pigs on the Heaths and Dorset, going on rather than boring cows, but getting a range of different grazing or other herbivorous animals on to, into the system. The idea they're gonna create a mosaic of habitats, they're gonna create disturbances like these pigs are doing wonderfully um, and uh, get a, a more dynamic wild system going. And of course, reintroducing what we think are key species. Beavers are the mammal of the moment in this country. I've got various colleagues say, well, various people who say to me, well, can we just put beavers everywhere? Um, Probably put them in Parliament, it might make a difference. But um, uh, yeah, so big interest in beavers. And of course, they are great ecosystem engineers, as we know. But other other key species, even predators. Predators, a few years ago, was like, oh my God, you can't bring lynx or wolves in this country. That's become much more talked about. And it's possible just because we've got this barrier between us and the rest of Europe. Most, I think every other European country has got wolves now. I think that's right. I read the other day. We just as haven't. Um, and uh, Sophie Montserrat might have shared this these pictures with you last week. She works with Rewilding Europe. But there's some wonderful visions of what rewilding might look like uh, in Britain and in Europe. Uh, so this is, I've grabbed these off, uh, off the Rewilding Britain and Rewilding Europe websites. They're probably copyrighted, so don't tell anyone. I've nicked them. 
So I'm not presenting them as my own. They're just, I think, beautiful visions. There's a cute, cute little pussycat there. It's a wildcat, of course. Um, doing there's a lynx up a tree with something. Oh, what is it? A fox is eating. That's a bit cruel, isn't it? Um, so these wonderful visions of a mosaic, complex landscape with lots of all these different trophic levels, large predators doing things. Uh, this is a sort of a lovely uh, vision of what rewilding might look like. Does this give us, does rewilding necessarily give us this uh, resilient, adaptive, complex systems for the future? I think a lot of people working on rewilding would say yes, but I think it's a bit more complicated than that. And so there's a paper I was involved in a few years ago where we tried to actually understand what rewilding might involve in order to establish these self-sustaining and complex ecosystems. So rather than assuming rewilding will do it, what can we do to make sure it does? And this whole opens a whole can of worms about what people think rewilding should be. So this is just my take on it. Others were just like, rewilding is perfect in and of itself and you can't mess with it. But I think given what we're facing, what I said earlier is um, we maybe should be thinking more uh, carefully about that. Anyway, I'm running out of time, my God. Um, so what we characterized rewilding here as, or it could be, is moving from a degraded state, that's an orangey triangle, to a re more rewilded state on three axes. One way we have this trophic complexity, we have these uh, predators and herbivores and grazers, whatever, which I talked about, which everyone talks about. Uh, another is dispersed, allowing connectivity between areas, allowing things to move around, uh, which is less talked about in rewilding, but certainly very important. I think one very interesting thing is disturbances. So disturbances in more natural systems are quite important drivers of diversity and change, and even bring, bring resilience. Uh, whereas actually in more managed systems, disturbance, we often try to stop disturbance, and that when it comes, it can be more damaging. And that's what these two pictures show. So in this top A, we've got a very managed, very modified landscape with these rather, these circles show the sort of trophic webs. They're rather depauperate, not many species involved, and they're not very well connected. And we've been holding off disturbance, a big disturbance happens. They're not, it's so major and it's such a poor system, you really, it really can't respond. And actually we, that disturbance leads to a loss from the system, which in which may never recover. And that you can imagine that going on and on and on and on until that system becomes worse and worse. And those disturbances, those extreme events, what I was talking about earlier under climate change. Whereas a rewilded system, which has these components, uh, those disturbances are probably less impactful, first of all. And they're because we're not trying to withhold them, like the old fire argument. If we try to stop wildfires, uh, that could be quite a bad thing for systems. It may be better if they could happen in small ways frequently rather than massive ones occasionally. But these systems are complex and resilient enough that they actually can respond very well to those disturbances. And at the end, things recover well. And actually, one thing we haven't captured there, but that that by setting things along different paths, those disturbances may actually drive more diversity in the system. So there's a vision for rewilding that actually thinks seeks to build that resilience for the future rather than just assuming it will arise naturally. Um, so this is a rather complicated table about restoration rewilding, just characterizing the differences between them. Um, and I won't really go into detail, but I think one thing I'll cover is that last thing, uh, that we have a huge knowledge base for restoration going back, research and practice going back many decades now, the knowledge base for rewilding is much worse just because it's a fairly new thing. But rewilding brings a lot to the table. I like to think of it like uh, rewilding is like the new kid on the block, or uh, even the wild child with lots of great ideas and rushing ahead. And we're not quite sure where we're going to go with it. Restoration is a bit like the aged relative who uh, has sherry at every night at seven o'clock and uh, keeps talking about the past. But can we get this? Uh, these two generations to speak to each other. And I think that could be a really quite useful way of building complexity and resiliency into, into systems. 
So Natalie Petarelli and I had a paper earlier this year where we talked about bringing together the best aspects of restoration rewilding to actually to work to get uh, better outcomes on landscapes. So you can think of a um, a degraded landscape here with you know not much in it, a few dead trees, a few remnants of bits and bobs around. And obviously, we want to move that towards a better state. So the classic restoration approach, unless we've got billions or many, many millions to spend, we have to do that restoration in small areas because it's so expensive to buy the seed or buy the trees, whatever. But we can do that. And you get these little patches of, of quite nice targeted habitat creation. Rewilded, it's a bit more random, things popping up all over the place. I'm not quite sure what that is. It's uh, Maybe it's that alien I spoke about earlier. But it, a few random things happening over the landscape, but maybe that's rather slow and... Uh, a bit patchy. If we do the two together, where we rest, do restoration set sites on different pathways and create different biodiversity hotspots, but we have rewilding in the rest uh, to soften the landscape, allow these areas to develop by their own core, but they're also being seeded. And by seeded, I mean not just by the plants, but by the animals in these restored areas, uh, can create quite a mosaic of different habitat types across the landscape. And that I would argue that that mosaic creates helps you create a, a variety and a dynamic and complex landscape. And in some sense, that's what some rewilding projects are doing. They call them rewilding, but people are doing these different things. So it's not like this is a wild new idea, but just trying to conceptualize what it might look like. So um, I've talked a lot about restoration and rewilding and how that might help us think about the future and this uncertainty by focusing on complexity, resilience, et cetera. There are other key actions which Charlie and I mentioned, but which are talked about uh, with the uncertainty of climate change. Uh, and I'm just going to touch on those briefly. You'll be pleased to hear. I won't go into great detail. Uh, assisted migration or assisted colonization, novel ecosystems. And one thing which I think is fascinating, the idea of facilitating adaptation or even speciation. Um, assisted colonization, I've racked my brains a bit about this. It's not something that's been written around a lot. It's people have talked about it, but this is where the idea you think, oh, I don't know, Capitalis, they're not doing very well where they are, and they're going to do really badly under climate change. So I'm going to move them somewhere else to some new climate space for them. I think the trouble with that is which species do we choose? Is it Capitalis? Is it some obscure little plant that a few botanists care about? Where do we move them to? Um, uh, what happens where you're moving them to? Is it how, how do you determine its suitability and what are the impacts of you doing these single species movements? And of course, climate change is not going to be going like from this to this new state, it's going to be continually changing. We don't, the climate models beyond the end of this century really are very extremely uncertain. We, don't, well, anyway, we may have driven ourselves back into the caves by the end of the century. So maybe everything will go be okay for the rest of the species on this planet. But um, as climate change, we don't know what really what's gonna happen. So how do, do we carry on moving them as climate change? Do we say, oh, well, Capicelli needs to go, I go over to Orkney. Um, so I would argue maybe this sort of picking out individual species and moving them <coughs> to track climate change is probably not very practical or sensible. And maybe this whole system approach which brings it back to restoration and rewilding is better. Um, novel ecosystems. So this is something that, again, has gone from a few years ago was seen as a terrible idea, but the idea that humans are creating new ecosystems, which are unprecedented, we haven't seen before, um, even some of which can play, contain non-native species, but they actually seem to be functioning okay. They seem to be if you think about it in terms of function and complexity rather than identity, they seem to be doing quite well. And Richard Hobbs in Australia has been a big proponent of this. And from being pilloried about it, that again has become becoming coming up the agenda. And so can we actually use this idea of novel ecosystems linked back to what I was talking about rewilding and restoration to purposefully manipulate systems for future conditions and maybe even using non-native species? That's that's people are talking talk about that. Uh, and uh, you know, not all non-native species are the same. Some are analogous to things we had in the past year, which we killed off. And finally, something which is not my expertise at all, but just to bring to the table, um, 
can we actually help species adapt to climate change? How do we do that? Move, move populations around, uh, create novel ecosystems. Uh, can we allow even help speciation? Uh, hybridization is a big thing. Uh, hybridization has happened a lot in the past. And actually, many Europeans and Asians are hybrids. We've all got a bit of Neanderthal in us. Well, many of us has, some more than others. Um, so we are, it's argued we actually are hybrids. That may have actually allowed us to adapt when, when Homo sapiens came, move into this harsh climate that was the end of the, of the ice ages. So hybridization, um, really nice paper. Uh, I wasn't anything to do with it last year, or this year, are uh, in uh, Western Australia, uh, where the work showed that uh, integration, hybridization of uh, these um, narrow range endemic rainbow fishes, you can see a picture of here, um, they hybridized with a warm adapted generalist. They basically, uh, their genomics suggested they'd be much less vulnerable to climate change. So is that a bad thing? Are they become is become them becoming different different to what they were? Good if they can survive climate change or better, more able to survive climate change, or is it bad because you're losing the identity of that species? That that second has been a traditional conservation approach. Maybe the first is maybe how we should be thinking. So what do we need? What well, what do we need for UK nature recovery under climate change? I'm I'm emphasizing UK here because. I'm loath to start saying what we should do in other parts of the world, just to really emphasize that. I think we can release a lot of land in this country for doing nature conservation and restoration and rewilding. And apparently there's a talk a couple of weeks ago, uh, what's his name? Dustin Benton. Dustin Benton, showing, yes, that was, oh, well, that you could release a lot of land. So if you've got any questions, ask him, because he's not here. Um, so in doing that, what we need to do is create a diversity of different types of ecosystem, which are heterogeneous, very variable and complex. We need to do that everywhere. And by everywhere, I mean when you have large areas, but also it needs to be permeating through our cities, our towns, our agricultural countryside. And that, that's what I mean by multi-scale as well. It's not just certain areas we do it in other areas where you just screw, carry on screwing things. We need to, it needs to be assisted with reintroductions, introductions, uh, moving things around, allowing connectivity. And this needs to be dynamic. Uh, we need to allow dy dynamism in space and time to allow resilience and adaptation. I'm gonna, final slide. How do we, how do we get it done? And you might think this is where we say, oh, we need to talk to the politicians and get them to do stuff. We tried that. So what, do we as scientists have to do? Well, I think uh, this is a very nice paper. I was involved by uh, Aaron Thierry, Charlie Gardner, William Rowlandson, and Julia Steinberger, all very uh, active in the uh, climate and ecological emergency debate, saying that scientists or academics need to provide leadership about where we're gonna go and getting change done. And this isn't the traditional approach of just providing information and ideas and providing the politicians with uh, testing of their ideas. They're saying we need to engage in advocacy and activism and get much more out there and saying, we know what's happening. We are some of the best people, or not best people, we're the some people who know most about what's happening. Sorry, wrong superlative. <laughs> You know most about what's happening, so we need to get out there and tell people this needs to be done. And we need to really, in a sense, shove it down their throats. We can't afford to stand back. And they also say, since I am standing in a university, universities need to have a role in this, they need to reconsider their role in society and explicitly recognize engagement policy and political process as part of the work mandate of their staff. So what this is arguing, and many other people out there argue, and I would argue, is that we need to get out there and get much more on the streets to say these things need to happen. We need to change, and we need to change now. And I said about climate change, we all know climate change is happening, and we, there are all these possibilities of what we might do. Obviously, the best thing would be if we could stop climate change tomorrow or next year, but soon. And that's part of this. It's not just saying, um, 
we need to do conservation, we need to stop climate change. And the final thing I would say, even if we stop climate change, we still need to do all this stuff for conservation because we've screwed this country so much in terms of our biodiversity. Even if you don't believe in climate change, which I assume you do, we still need to do all these things to get our environment back and to provide a home for all these other thousands of species we share this country with. Thank you. Thank you, James. Very, very powerful point to, to, to end on. I'm sure there's lots of questions out there. So we'll open up to the, to the floor. Any, any questions? Oh. <laughs> oh, Julia can kick off. There you go. <laughs> Okay, so I'll go. I'll 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 start straight away with that that final point. Um, so that that call is quite a quite a quite a strong call because it goes beyond simply engaging in the policy process and actually suggests engaging in the political process. But that's that's quite a those those are two very very different things. And I'd just like to hear your reflection. You know, you, you don't need me to tell you the arguments against becoming actively political in an academic public role because of the you know changes in political parties can then reduce long-term impact you know that's that's well understood and that's why often many academics try and avoid actual political they'll they'll stop the line at engaging in policy but making evidence-based arguments but not making political arguments but I'd like to hear your reflection on that point perhaps yeah so I guess it depends what you mean by political. By political. And interestingly, on the way out, listening to a radio program where they're talking about um, lawyers and lefty lawyers and the idea that these lawyers, by engaging with the legal process to help their clients, they're being called by the government lefty lawyers and being called political. So I, I, I think there is a massive difference between saying getting involved in part political process and getting involved in that broad aspect of politics. Um, and I guess in a sense, the activists would say they're not really getting involved in politics, they're getting involved in actually trying to make change happen. And whether it's conservative in charge, labor in charge, even if the Green Party was in charge, maybe if they weren't doing what's needed to be done, that I think that's what it's about. It's about saying what's being done isn't enough. And we, we have some ideas what needs to be done, the minimum needs to be done, uh, so really, you need to engage with that rather than, I guess, the um, providing evidence as well. The policymakers saying, oh, we're doing something called 30 by 30. Could you give us some evidence around it? And then it's like, oh, I don't quite like that because that involves we've got to tell people stop eating meat. So can you tell us something different? And I'm not, uh, you know, that's something I've come across. I'm not going to give any more information about that because it's probably breaking confidence. But I, so I think it's actually saying, Rather than saying, what do you want to know about? Here's some information saying, this is what you really need to do, or you really need to engage with this. So I, I, I think it is a change, and it's something which a lot of academics are not maybe not very happy with. But I think people like these guys are writing papers to really put forward those arguments. I should just say, at the British Ecological Society meeting in Belfast, later this year, there'll be a, a workshop on engaging in activism and what does it mean for people in their careers. So something we can, if you're there, we can debate some more about that. But it is it is a bit of a change in mindset, but I something I think a lot of us, I'm not saying we have to go through, but something I've gone through, I see no dissonance there. Thank you for the talk. Uh, so I'm I'm curious about the complexity. So you touch a lot about complexity, uh, and in one of, in, in one of the your last slides about it, you mesh, you just said basically let's increase complexity without basically any baseline, without knowing uh, no target. So how much complexity is enough? That's a really good point, and it's a. In a sense, it's a bit like conservation. How many skylarks are enough? As a colleague used to say to me, how many, how many of anything is enough? And that's something which the project, with the terrible acronym REST RECA, were looking at about what's the relationship between these complexity measures and these various other aspects of resilience and function. So, is it um, 
if it's strongly linear, then you, more and more is best. It's probably going to be some sort of plateauing thing. So uh, that's what we expect. So I guess it's sort of watch this space. We probably need to academically need to try to understand what those relationships are. Um, but and we need to actually know how how to bring together these different, way, different ways of measuring complexity and putting it into one basket. So the simple answer is not quite sure yet, but I think we can probably take our baseline from what we're seeing out there about well-functioning resilient systems, very few of which we have in this country anymore, because even our very protect, our protected areas are generally highly managed. And if we step away from them, they're screwed. So maybe elsewhere in the world, we're actually looking at things which are better, more self-sustaining. So I think it's a bit of a non-answer, but I think it's also saying it's a work in progress. But I always say in conservation, we shouldn't wait for an answer, uh, the absolute answer before going ahead. I think we know what to do to move towards complexity. So let's start doing that. And then as we gather information, we can start saying how much is enough. I think Michael's been waving his hand around for a long time. Can you go back to one slide? I can. You like my acronym for that? Uh, dead. Dead. Yeah, exactly. So, so I think this really that, that is this, 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 <laughs> this, this really summarizes very well. So you can you all if even if you do all of these beautiful things, you're still dead. I think that's <laughs> that's uh, that's the the conclusion from well, your talk. I, guess. I mean, I think yeah. I, I guess my point is that I've said my I've tried to say throughout is that these are things which we can hopefully do to improve the chances of biodiversity, native biodiversity, et cetera, under climate change, et cetera. But this is all a bit like that. We're not yeah. quite sure, especially with the uncertainty about the future. Well, but this can put us in a better place. But, but my, my question is really, when you look at the definition of the, the, the objective of the Climate Change Convention, it's uh, about uh, choosing a, a greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere such that ecosystems can adapt naturally. That's the first thing. And then uh, then comes uh, uh, food security and other things. And so uh, I think we, the conservation biologist community, uh, didn't do our homework, I guess. We did not inform you know, the 1.5 degree uh, target or the two degree mm. target. And uh, probably... Uh, there's a lot to be done on, on on that because when you the more we investigate and show we actually see even 1.5 means dead huh? yeah I, I agree and i think there's it's it's one a sort of thing that escaped the ecological community i think the uh the climate scientists took it over and they started defining what they meant by an ecosystem like the amazon is an ecosystem and that's one of the other things like the amazon dieback so yeah and i think one of the problems is ecologists the troubles you ask them, it is it it isn't rocket science. It's much more, much more complicated than that. And this, as I was trying to show, the more you dig into it, you've got extinction cascades, you've got you know, interactions and things. But there's probably there probably is some sort of middle way where we can start saying, you know, this probably even these small changes are pretty pretty bad. And maybe if we'd been there right at the start, saying these things, it'd been one point one. Bit point to say 1.1 now, but you know, even even 1.5 would have been not, you know, the, the amount of danger for the what the other millions of species on this planet is much greater than expected. So, yeah, but we are where we are now. So, what I'm trying to think dead is just I thought it's quite funny how that came out, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean I'm too, I'm actually, I think I'm an optimistic pessimist or a pessimistic optimist, it's one of the two. I think we're screwed, but I think maybe we can make it less screwed than it would have been otherwise. With zero emissions, you get dazed in there. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> dazed and confused. And... I think a couple of online heard that. Yeah, that's a, uh... Okay, there's a couple. Uh, there's one from uh, Ariel de Diaz. Uh, uh, in your Opinion, ecosystem integrity and ecosystem complexity are, are they similar concepts and how much do they overlap because there's a lot of effort especially in the gbf has focused on highlighting ecosystem integrity i'd say um i think ecosystem, ecosystem integrity is very much linked with the idea of degradation so it's it is in some sense linked to this historical state idea 
that there is some perfect state this thing was in the past, which we want to return to, was I think perhaps moves you away from that. So um, I'm not, it's a bit like health, soul health, ecosystem health. I think they're a bit of a weird, mm -hmm. some of these complex I find weird and immeasurable as well. And that's one of my problems with integrity. Um, so so I'd, say, I'd say, I may, integrity might include complexity, but yeah, yes. I'm not convinced by that. Okay, I'll take one more from online. This is a, uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, <laughs> we've uh, seen this week with a COVID inquiry that national decision makers and leaders did not necessarily fully understand the scientific or academic information presented to them. What do you think the lessons are there for uh, responding to climate change? <laughs> That's a bit of a big question. Um, well, I'm going to be political with a, either a big, is it big or small P now? Uh, but I think what the COVID inquiry is is saying is not that they the politicians didn't understand that they chose not to understand they didn't spend the time to engage and this is one of my bugbears about when we as scientists or academics are told to engage with politicians great engage with them and we'll try to make sure we communicate in a comprehensible way but the politicians have a job as well to actually engage with us and listen to us and try to understand what the hell's going on and i think that showed really that failure and i i do find that that's part of the problem is politicians not listening and the terrible i mean I'm very political now but the um terrible amateur approach we have to politics in this country where you have a cabinet minister who's just put in that post as a path to promotion to the next post not necessarily because they have any expertise or knowledge to actually carry out the post. So I think the political process is problematic here. I think the scientists are less to blame. That's controversial because we're always blamed for not being able to talk to, uh, to others outside our field mm -hmm. and talk about generalized dissimilarity models as if people understand them, whereas only Tom does. <laughs> okay, we'll take a couple more, so one there. You can just back. Is, the, is this working still? Oh, my battery's died, sorry. I use that. I think that online, you can do that. Yep. Yes. Um, so, um, obviously, one of the big concerns with rewilding, as you mentioned, was that um, the evidence base for it is still quite narrow. And for the uh, approaches that you mentioned at the very end, obviously, it's even more so. Um, but given sort of with how quickly things are moving in terms of the biodiversity crisis and all of that, um, is there any point at do you think there's sort of any point at which it's sort of a possibility on the table to sort of um do one of uh, something like um um intentional species um movement without necessarily um being able to test it fully like is there any point at which you sort of just need to sort of hedge your bets because it's better than nothing um both for rewilding but also for the for the other stuff yeah, that, that is a very interesting point. We had um, PJ and I organised a meeting earlier this year about nature recovery. And uh, it was talk about, you know, oh, scientific evidence, what we need to do and whatever. And uh, one or two in the audience at the end saying, we need to just do it. They were calling down the great god Nike and saying, just do it. And there is, I think we've moved, there is, that's a very interesting area because Traditionally, scientists be like, oh, we need to get the evidence together. If we introduce links, what's it going to do? Is it going to eat people? Is it going to, is it going to eat cats? Um, what are wolves going to do? How are we going to form packs properly? Maybe there's an element of where we just need to, with such a state, we need to just risk it. But I think with monitoring and a close scientific overview is the big thing. I think there's, if I was to criticize rewilding, which I'm not really going to do, is that there's loads of wonderful projects going on, but the scientific input and the scientific engagement is poor and i have a sore point which you've been to those i i just heard this week a grant proposal i put in on looking at a rewilding project trying to understand the processes has turned down and that's okay maybe i didn't write it very well but um i, I think i did um but that i think that they've got great loads of bottom-up stuff happening but the side there needs to be some way of getting the scientists involved to actually look at what's happening understand the mechanism the processes and that could be so like shit things are going really wrong we need to pull the plug now or this is well, there's all these wonderful things happening but we have some understanding of them so there's i think yeah do it but do it with scientists involved to understand what's happening and and so a quick follow-up um 
do you think in that suite of sort of um really radical approaches, do you think geoengineering at all is something that we should even be considering on the table? Because I mean, if you're to sort of changing habitats intentionally, is is that really like, you know, geoengineering? I I I'm gonna I'm gonna pull the ignorance card here and say I, I I'm not I'm not that happy with geoengineering, <laughs> but I'm no expert on it. So my opinion would be of a bloke down the pub. Um, uh, which after a few pints. Um, so yeah, I I haven't heard anything good about it. I guess that's what I would say. And it's it's probably a bit like carbon capture. It's a bit of a yeah. bit of a what's the word? That's a stupid idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I think if nothing, nothing more coming up, so I think we'll wrap up there. Thank, thank you, James, for such a broad ranging talk uh, covering the challenge of climate change. I think uh, this, this idea of where how restoration and rewilding can complement each other is a really important uh, framing for that. And also, I think his ideas of what our roles are as yes. citizen scientists, activists uh, in this whole process. So thank you for touching on all those points. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.